Hello everyone, welcome to the channel. I am the casual driver coming at you again with another episode of how to tune your car. In the last episode, we gave the Supra all the grip it'll ever need by upgrading and tuning the brakes, tires, and suspension. This episode, it's all about engines. And this time around, we'll push that underpowered 1G GTE to its limits with the help of a slew of engine modifications. I'll walk you guys through my process for adding power to my cars, while also explaining what the parts are, how they work, and what they do. After we've added all that power, the car will need some mild suspension adjustments, and then once the car is dialed in again, we'll take both an uphill and downhill run on the mountain, and finally run the Horizon Mexico circuit to benchmark our upgrades. There are quite a few different ways to add power to an engine, from simple bolt-ons like a cold air intake or an exhaust system, all the way up to the intricate, extensive work of changing around parts in the rotating assembly or doing machine work on an engine block. In the real world, putting all these parts together and making them work properly is a delicate, expensive, time-consuming process, often fraught with hiccups and headaches. Luckily for us, it's a bit simpler of a process in Forza Horizon 5. You don't have to worry about compatibility, fit and finish, troubleshooting, or any other ale that comes with building up an engine in real life. You want to throw a giant single turbo on a stock engine? No problem. You don't have to worry about air-fuel ratio, ignition timing, plumbing, fabrication, any of that. Just click and install and your mods will add power flawlessly. While the in-game operation of modifications is user-friendly to the point of fantasy, this doesn't mean that we can't keep the process a little more believable on our end. We're not playing a racing simulator here, it's not supposed to be annoyingly difficult. It's Forza Horizon, it's supposed to be fun and entertaining. However, a dash of realism makes the world go round. For example, if I'm satisfied with an engine's power level, but I want to hear a little bit more of it, I'll add a cold air intake because induction noises are the best engine noises. If you disagree with me, leave a comment below. Let's argue in the comments about it. If I just want a little more power, I'll add in some fuel and ignition tuning and maybe an exhaust system if I can tolerate the noise. Still not satisfied? Then add a camshaft and valves to raise your red line, gain quite a bit more power, and let that engine breathe. If you're feeling particularly bold, why not force the engine to breathe a little harder with the help of a turbo or supercharger? We've already got the supporting mods with fuel and ignition, so why not make massive power gains with forced induction? Throw an intercooler into the mix to keep up the illusion, and we are fast approaching the power ceiling. Good thing we're not here to play it safe. Boring the block and swapping in some high compression pistons will give us one more boost in power. After this, we can add oil and cooling modifications to milk a few more horsepower, as well as the illusion of reliability, and then we've reached our power ceiling. The only engine mod left is the flywheel, which I prefer to leave up to personal preference. I'll explain why in a minute. Now, we could simply add all of the race level modifications, install, and go blast around in a comically overpowered Supra, but I've always been a little too curious for my own good. What do all these parts do? How does changing them add power to an engine? Do turbochargers operate on black magic and witchcraft? Well, yes, but uh, it's, it's not that simple. Let's take a look, starting with one of the simplest modifications, the intake. The intake is the tract that air passes through to enter the combustion chamber. An aftermarket intake will use a high flow air filter located in an area that draws plenty of ambient temperature air along with smooth bends to reduce turbulence and a larger diameter than stock to allow a higher volume of airflow. While it's good for a few horsepower, replacing the intake on its own won't do much without replacing the throttle body along with it. In order to take advantage of the improved intake pipe, the throttle body should also be replaced with one larger in diameter, reducing or erasing the restriction of the factory body. Turbocharged and air-to-air -air intercooled supercharged cars will also benefit from larger diameter charge pipes, which is the intake piping after the turbo or supercharger. And last on the intake list is an upgraded intake manifold, which serves to equalize and increase flow and velocity to all cylinders, usually by means of long, symmetrical intake runners, which is the passage from the body of the intake manifold to the intake ports on the cylinder head. All of these parts in tandem facilitate superior airflow and volume, which will allow more fuel to be used, as well as better atomization of the fuel. All of this means more power. So we've got a rough idea of how air gets into the combustion chamber. But what about fuel? Well, fuel is pumped into the cylinders by way of a fuel pump, 
lines, and either a carburetor or fuel injectors. The Supra employs port fuel injection, meaning the fuel injectors spray their fuel ahead of the cylinder in the intake port. There will be one injector per cylinder, allowing for a consistent fueling of all cylinders. As we add airflow to an engine, we also need to increase fuel flow to maintain the proper air-fuel mixture. To increase fuel flow, we'll need both a stronger, larger fuel pump, as well as larger capacity injectors. Either on their own won't do too much, if anything. A larger pump on stock fuel injectors will create a bottleneck at the injectors. Once they've reached their peak, the stock injectors or anything too small for your pump simply can't flow more fuel no matter how much the pump is sending to them. On the reverse side, a stock fuel pump won't be able to supply enough fuel to utilize the capacity of larger injectors. So you kind of need to do both. When it comes to upgrading, Forza takes care of the heavy lifting for us though. The street option for the fuel system upgrades looks like an ECM or some sort of fuel injection manager with which we should be able to adjust the timing and duration of the injector pulses. The sport level upgrade looks like a billet fuel rail with a pressure regulator with a gauge on it along with an aftermarket fuel pump which should give us more flow and more consistent pressure. And finally the race level upgrade looks like a fuel cell, brand new set of injectors, and a couple of things that are a little too small for me to see, but that should give us all the fuel delivery we will ever need. So we know how air and fuel get into the cylinder, but at that point, all we have is some smelly, wet air. What we need to do is light it, and that'll be the job of the ignition system. Ignition tuning is fairly simple. Your options here include spark plug gap size and spark timing. Larger plug wires may also provide the benefit of a lower resistance, better tolerance of resistance increase from heat, and more consistent spark delivery through their lifespan. Tightening of the spark plug gap is often used in forced induction applications, providing a more intense spark to light the more dense mixture of air and fuel. Ignition timing refers to how advanced or retarded the spark is in relation to top dead center, measured in degrees. Generally, the more advanced your spark is, the more power you'll make. The goal here is to have ignition happen early enough so that when the mixture is at its maximum point of force, the piston is just starting to come down from top dead center on the power stroke. However, if timing is moved too far one way or the other, the engine will end up running kind of poorly. Too far advanced will lead to knocking, where the air-fuel mixture expands against a piston that is still running as compression stroke, and this is not good. It's a bunch of extra stress on your engine parts. It's a waste of fuel. It makes a significant increase in heat. It's, it's a bad time for everyone involved. With the ignition timing too far retarded, the burning mixture will be chasing a piston that's already moving down on its power stroke. This will lead to a noticeable decrease in engine power. But as usual, Forza Horizon 5 handles all those pesky details for us, and all we see is a trouble-free power increase. After the air-fuel mixture is burnt, it is then pushed out of the exhaust port past the exhaust valve, through a manifold, and then through a length of pipe that uses resonators and mufflers to quiet and tone the sound, and a catalytic converter to reduce harmful emissions. Factory exhaust systems are designed to be cheap, durable, and quiet, and as a result, the performance of these systems tends to take a back seat. Options to improve flow here include an upgraded exhaust manifold, or headers, which aim to maintain the velocity of exhaust gas pulses, as well as timing their movement through the piping to enhance the scavenging effect. When a pulse of exhaust gas is fired out of a cylinder, it creates a vacuum behind it which, when properly timed, will help pull another cylinder's exhaust pulse out more efficiently, scavenging the next exhaust pulse. On turbocharged cars, the importance of scavenging is slightly less. The turbine creates a restriction in the exhaust path that nullifies scavenging to some degree. However, exhaust pulse timing on the turbine is still important for performance, and appropriately sized headers will keep exhaust pulses spinning the turbine at consistent intervals. After passing through the turbo's exhaust housing, gases travel through a downpipe, and generally a larger diameter downpipe lessens restriction and may also employ mandrel bending, where a pipe is bent with a die inside of it so that the pipe maintains its diameter through these bends. Often, factory exhaust will be bent by a standard pipe bender, which is faster, cheaper, and easier, but at the cost of the bends being a smaller diameter than the straights, creating restriction and turbulence. 
The catalytic converter usually resides in the downpipe, and this device uses a chemical reaction to break apart harmful pollutants into less harmful compounds like water vapor and carbon dioxide. However, manufacturers generally need to pass fairly strict emission standards, and as such, an OEM cat creates a lot of restriction. The best change here is a high-flow catalytic converter, which retains much of the benefit of a factory cat while still increasing flow to a point almost identical to a test pipe, or straight pipe. Do not run test pipes. Filter your exhaust. This message brought to you by the Environmental Protection Agency. After the plumbing is taken care of, the last restriction to remove is the factory muffler. Many OEM mufflers use a reverse flow muffler, which is the best at quieting down the exhaust noise to a level that governments and the average consumer can tolerate. However, these mufflers also tend to flow the worst of the various types. We'll swap in a straight-through muffler to save weight, drastically improve flow, and still keep the noise level slightly below ear shattering. The process of opening and closing valves, as well as their mechanical timing, valve lift length, and amount of time spent open, are controlled by one or more camshafts. The 1G GTE of the Supra uses dual overhead direct acting camshafts, one for intake valves and another for exhaust valves. This means that the lobes of the camshaft will directly open the valves as opposed to a pushrod engine or one with tappets or rocker arms, which do not directly open the valves. Instead, a camshaft operates one side of a rocker, which levers open the valve, or pushes up a push rod, which also presses a rocker or a tappet to open the valve. Direct acting overhead cams allow for more precise valve control and less valve train mass, which can open up the ability for higher RPMs. To some extent, we'll want to increase lift and duration of the camshaft to allow for maximum optimized airflow. As an added bonus, a more aggressive camshaft gives the engine a tough, choppy sound, which is a truly glorious sound. We should all be thankful for aggressive camshaft noises. Valves seal the combustion chamber during the compression and power strokes and open up to allow air in on the intake stroke and allow air out on the exhaust stroke. Potential changes here include larger diameter valves to accommodate larger than stock ports, stiffer springs to reduce the risk of valve float, and possibly different spring seats, retainers, and keepers. It's a little unclear to me what the different valve upgrades in Horizon 5 offer specifically other than a power increase, so I'll just assume the race valves option upgrades all of those things. A turbocharger is a great way to add a lot of power to any engine and is almost a necessity for small displacement engines to hit those ultra high power marks. Turbo operation is actually quite clever. A turbine is spun by exhaust gases flowing through the turbine housing or exhaust housing and attached to the turbine on the opposite end via a shared shaft is a compressor wheel. As the turbine spins, so does the compressor, which pulls air from the intake into the compressor housing. Inside the compressor housing, and at every point from there to the combustion chamber, air is pressurized by the compressor wheel. This pressurized air is more dense than atmospheric pressure, which means more oxygen can be pushed into the same volume of space. In this case, the combustion chamber. More oxygen means you can add more fuel, and more air plus more fuel equals more power. However, without some sort of check system, a turbocharged engine would run out of control very quickly. This is where waste gates and blow-off valves come in. Waste gates are generally vacuum actuated, meaning that once the engine reaches a certain level of boost, a diaphragm is compressed, controlling a valve that routes exhaust gas away from or around the turbine and directly into the exhaust pipe. This prevents overspeeding of the turbo, as well as maintaining a consistent maximum boost pressure. Blow-off valves are fitted on the compressor side of the turbo and serve to relieve excess pressure on the intake. When running at wide open throttle at max boost, the turbo has a lot of rotational inertia. If you quickly remove your foot from the throttle, such as during a gear change, the valve in the throttle body will close just as quickly, but the turbo is still spinning really fast. Without a blow-off valve, this leads to an event known as compressor surge, where the pressurized air in front of the compressor wheel seeks the path of least resistance. With the throttle closed and the cylinders not drawing much air, this pressurized air will attempt to go out the way it came in, past the compressor wheel. This can result in a sudden, harsh, albeit momentary stalling of the compressor wheel. This effect does have a cool sound to it, known as turbo flutter, but it can and likely will cause a lot of premature wear and tear on a turbo's rotating assembly. 
Luckily, we won't have to worry about compressor surge with a blow-off valve. There are two types of blow-off valve, recirculating and atmospheric. Recirculating blow-off valves release pressure in front of the turbo, and atmospheric blow-off valves vent excess pressure to the atmosphere. Makes sense, right? Both styles use a vacuum line connected downstream of the throttle body for reference. Under wide open throttle, the pressure on the top of the blow-off valve, where the vacuum reference is located, is equal to that of the bottom, between the turbo and the throttle body, keeping the valve closed. Upon closing the throttle, the pressure to the top of the blow-off valve, after the throttle body, is less than that at the bottom, in between the throttle body and the turbo, and that extra pressure forces open a piston in the blow-off valve that vents the excess pressure. All of the operational mechanics of turbos might seem ridiculously complicated, and they certainly can be. After all, they do operate on black magic and witchcraft. So let's simplify it a little bit. What can you upgrade to make your turbo system better? Well, a larger and more aggressively pitched turbine and compressor wheel is a good place to start. Larger rotating bits mean more lag and more energy required to spool, but they'll also grab more air and move more air, which provides heaps more boost at maximum speed. A stiffer wastegate actuator will allow the turbine to spin faster before dumping exhaust out, increasing boost pressure in the process. Lastly, a certain turbo can only do so much. For a massive change, swapping a different model turbo might be the best move. Many aftermarket style turbos offer design improvements that would be impossible with the factory turbo's construction. Our Supra utilizes twin CT12 turbos made by Toyota in parallel configuration, meaning two turbos of the same size run in tandem to decrease lag time, increase overall boost pressure relative to a larger single turbo or a smaller single turbo. They aim to be the best of both worlds in this regard. Other options include sequential twin turbos, which uses one small turbo that covers the low RPM range for boost, and one large turbo for high RPM boost, cutting lag time across the board while maintaining the crazy boost levels of the large turbo. Judging from the appearance of the race twin turbo icon, this upgrade will provide a significantly larger inlet and compressor wheel, and while we can't see it, we can assume that it also provides a larger exhaust housing and turbine, along with new waste gates and blow-off valves. With a promise of 68 more horsepower from those turbos alone, no other mod comes close on bang for your buck with the Supra. Running a turbocharger is not without its trade-offs, however. The downside of forcibly pressurizing air is that this heats up the air being compressed. Combine this with all the heat radiating from the engine, and you've got some seriously spicy air. This hot, spicy air works against the benefit a turbo provides, which is more dense oxygen. As the air in the intake heats up, it expands, lowering the density of the oxygen. Assuming the same level of pressure, hot air in the intake holds less oxygen than cold air in the intake. And less oxygen means less power. Thankfully, many genius engineers have found a way to solve this issue. Intercoolers. Intercoolers function similarly to radiators, where tubing is wound through many small fins to increase the surface area that heat can radiate through, consequently allowing passing air to take off more heat. In the case of an intercooler, it is pressurized intake air being cooled, which is post-turbo. This causes the air to become more dense once again, allowing oxygen to be more dense, increasing the ability to burn more fuel. With intercoolers, in general, bigger is better here. The larger the intercooler, the better its ability to cool air. The engine block is the centerpiece of our whole operation. It houses the pistons, connecting rods, crankshaft, coolant passages, cylinders, everything that makes an engine an engine. The block is the structural base for everything else that happens. As for modifications, the only one that can really be done strictly to the engine block is overboring. This means that each cylinder will be machined to a larger diameter to increase displacement. When it comes to making power, there is certainly no replacement for displacement. With the Supra, we have the option to go from 2 liter displacement all the way up to 3 liters. That is huge! That's a 50% increase just from boring over. All that material removed is good for 23 horsepower on its own, placing it at third best single mod for horsepower gains. In real life, boring out your cylinders weakens the cylinder wall to some extent and may require a sleeve made of a stronger material to be fit into the cylinder to maintain strength. 
As usual though, Forza Horizon 5 takes care of the details for us, and all we see is trouble-free gains in power and displacement. Pistons are the big round plugs that move up and down the cylinder, compressing the air-fuel mixture on the compression stroke, and being forced down to turn the crankshaft via connecting rod on the power stroke. With the help of a few rings and a film of oil, pistons are also the barrier between the combustion chamber and the crankcase. There are a few ways to increase performance with piston swaps. First, we'll need bigger pistons for our bored out cylinders. The added volume will allow more air and fuel to be burnt. Second, we may replace the pistons with a set made of a lighter material to decrease rotating mass and increase engine response. Third, we can choose pistons with a different design on their face. OEM pistons often have relief cuts on the face to accommodate valve clearance or a bowl shape to direct combustion of the air-fuel mixture. If clearance allows, we want to raise the reliefs on these pistons to decrease the volume of the combustion chamber, which raises the static compression ratio. The smaller the volume of the combustion chamber with the piston at top dead center, the more pressure the contents will be under. Assuming your fuel doesn't detonate, this means that the extra pressure on the air-fuel mixture will lead to a much more forceful burn and a more forceful expansion, leading to more power as well as improved thermal efficiency. With all this extra power, we will certainly be testing the limits of our engine's fluids. The OEM radiator won't be able to cool the coolant fast enough, leading to higher water pressure, potential leaks, and even boiling. That's not good. The solution here is simple. Swap in a bigger radiator. The street-level oil-slash-cooling upgrade includes a thick radiator with a nice beefy fan on it. This will help keep our coolant at the ideal temperature. There are no power gains to be had from a better radiator alone, but it'll keep the engine running properly and coolly while I'm beating the snot out of it. The oil will also be seeing extreme temperatures, and the sport-level upgrade offers an oil cooler and a catch can. The oil cooler is a small radiator that oil is pushed through, and a catch can is placed in the positive crankcase ventilation line between the crankcase and the intake manifold. This hose relieves excess pressure in the crankcase by venting to the intake and can send oil and other contaminants into your intake. Blech, gross. A catch can will stop a good deal of this junk from going back into your intake while still venting that positive pressure. The race level upgrade looks to be a dry sump oil system where oil is stored in external tank rather than at the bottom of an oil pan. The benefits of a dry sump setup are great for the kind of race car we want the Supra to be. Because oil is stored in a remote tank, capacity and placement are virtually limitless. And also, because the oil reserve isn't under the crankshaft, we don't risk dipping the crankshaft in excess oil or depriving and starving the oil pickup tube of oil, as might happen during long corners with a wet sump system. Overall, for an additional 20 pounds, we get an increase of 7 horsepower, and peace of mind that our already indestructible video game car will never suffer from overheating or oil starvation. Sounds good to me. The flywheel is a large diameter wheel connected to the crankshaft at the rear of the engine, and serves several purposes. One is to store rotational energy, as well as expend that energy as needed. As a given piston moves on its power stroke, it turns the crankshaft and adds to the flywheel's rotational energy. During the intermittent periods that the engine isn't firing, the flywheel sends some rotational energy back to the crankshaft to keep the engine turning. The overall effect of this energy sharing is a consistent and smooth rotational output, meaning the rest of the drivetrain, out through the wheels and tires, won't feel the inconsistent increase and decrease in power as the engine runs through its various strokes. Another use is for starting the engine. Flywheels have teeth cut into their circumference that are spun by the starter motor when the engine cranks over. Lastly, the flywheel serves as the surface that the friction disc of the clutch grabs onto. When it comes to modifications, Forza offers us a few options. Each step up provides a lighter flywheel than the last. Sounds good, right? Weight reduction is always a bonus. And less rotational mass should allow the engine to change speed quicker, making for better response across the board. Race car stuff. Uh, however, it's not quite that simple. Using a lighter flywheel may cause an engine to tend to bog down easier, such as on an uphill. With less mass to store rotational energy, a lighter flywheel won't be able to send as much energy back to the crankshaft on non-power strokes. 
This flywheel also won't be able to send as much energy through the drivetrain to the wheels, meaning you'll need to rev higher and engage the clutch slower to avoid stalling when taking off. Lastly, a lighter flywheel will have much less of a damping effect on speed differences between the engine and the rest of the drivetrain. This means you'll need to be much more precise with throttle, clutch, and shifting inputs. In Forza, however, I don't really see these as much of a problem as I do an opportunity. It's good training to force yourself to need more precision. But at the end of the day, it really is all personal preference. You don't need to run the lightest flywheel if you don't like it. It doesn't matter that much. It's not a make or break on whether your car is a race car or whether it's a street car or whatever else. It all boils down to what you prefer. So try a few different options and see how you like the feel of each one and see if you can notice the difference between them. If you can, leave a comment below. Let me know which one's your favorite. Do you like the heavy OEM flywheel? Or do you like that light as heck race car flywheel? Let me know. <sighs> okay, now that I've described every working part in an engine in exhaustive detail, it's time to throw some of these upgrades on the car. Let's go do that. Now, normally I'd install mods as I might in real life, in order of lowest to highest difficulty, while driving the car around for some time after adding a part or two so that I can get a feel for the difference. But in the interest of time, I'll just throw all the race upgrades on and proceed with the driving demonstrations. Let's go run the mountain. Alright, here we are with all the upgrades installed, getting ready to start the uphill run. And we're off in second gear. Little hot on the entry, leads to a bit of tailspin there. Coming strong out of the first 180 degree corner. The Supra looking very lively compared to the previous upgrade levels. Now that it has the power to match that suspension, it's a much more well-rounded vehicle. A lot of practice went into these runs. I think I've probably spent three, four hours just running up and down the mountain trying to figure out this car. I'm not used to driving a car that's still its factory weight with all of the other upgrades on it. I believe the, the factory weight of this Supra is about 3,300 pounds, which is not that heavy, relatively speaking. But it also has fairly thin tires, so the combination of that extra weight, the thin tires, and now all of this power and extra suspension modifications and all of that makes it a little imbalanced. It, it feels kind of heavy. You'll notice I have a tougher time now carrying speed through the corners, picking my braking points, and even here and there picking th throttle points as well. Here's a good example. Got to brake way earlier than I think I need to. The car turns well, but it doesn't stop well, and that's just because of its weight. Again, it looks like almost like I'm braking too early there. And then the car, it, 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 it gets through the corner. It's tough getting through the corner, though. Spent a lot of time just slightly adjusting various suspension settings to get it to drive just how I wanted to get it to drive. Before I recorded this clip, I was spinning out left and right, oversteering, understeering, brake lock, all sorts of mess. The couple of adjustments though, I've got it back where I want it, and it's it's so much easier to drive now. This car is kind of awesome. Guests on the hill there. That's another heavy braking corner. That one threw me off at first too. Because you can go in super hot, but you've got to slow down way earlier than I might think I need to. 
I don't generally drive cars with all the power mods and all the handling mods that are still their stock weight. Usually if I'm this far along into modifying a car, a weight reduction is one of the first things I do, but it doesn't really fit the bill for what we're doing here, so it, it needed to be shelved for a moment, so I'm still at stock weight. It's an interesting challenge. The Supra has always been a little tail happy, and to some extent I've been able to fix a lot of that just by being a little more careful with my right foot. Oh, thanks Harry. Gift from Harry. It's always when I'm recording these guys show up. You're kind soul, Harry, but I'm in the middle of something right now. Oh, hello. More guests. Getting towards the end of the uphill run now. This corner always throws me off. I think that I want to go through it full throttle, but you definitely can't. You'll slide off the side of the mountain. And usually right about here is where I'll call it. Okay. Well, that's the uphill, folks. Now, let's get to the downhill. Okay, now that I've worked my way up the mountain, it is time to head back down. Let's boogie. Once again, the car is showing its weight. It is quite easy to accelerate to high speed on the downhill. Not quite so easy to turn. We'll see it at this corner again too. This is a second gear turn going uphill. I manage it in third, but I'm fairly low in third gear. decently strong through those curves. This corner has a tricky transition midway through it. And then there's this one where you have to stand on the brakes, second gear, and then floor it out of there. More guests. It's a very busy day on the mountain today. Coming up is another tricky section can go quick through there and through here, but then you need to stand on the brakes into third here. It reduces a little bit more there, and we're out. Heavy on the brakes. Stay in third, though. And floor it. Yet another deceptive corner. It, it almost looks like you can go through it wide open. You can't. Or I can't. The slalom run here. Always a tricky one, but when you nail it, it feels great. More heartbreaking, more aggressive turning. I actually quite like that little section there on the downhill. Feels like a little roller coaster. And then this one trips me up too. I think I want to break here to prepare myself for the sharp exit. But uh, as it turns out, that's actually going to be... Wait for it. Wait for it. Not here. Well, that's a hard break too. I confuse that one with this one. Sharper exit to a sharper downhill to a hard breaking zone. The Supra is just running like a roller skate with a rocket strap to it right now. Good break in there. That one tends to trip me up as well.
It's not too bad at carrying speed, but you can still see that it's just that weight that hinders it in the corners. A little bit of understeer there, and that's at 70, 75 miles an hour. Nice and easy through there. And then hard on the brakes. Another carousel roller coaster section to the final downhill section. A long, mostly straight, with a particularly difficult to judge braking zone, especially with this land yacht. We make it though a little slower than I'd like, but at least I didn't go off the course. And we're done. How about that? I gotta say, this, the Super is doing pretty good. It definitely took some getting used to, but I like where it's at right now. And now for our benchmark. We're gonna run the Horizon Mexico circuit once more. We'll see how much all these power mods speed us up. Good bit of wheel spin off the line. Up through third. Probably should shift into fourth, but that's okay. It's a third gear corner anyways. Good grip. Still just kind of feeling it out at this point. Heavy braking for this corner. Sharp, wide, and sharp again. This corner is my nemesis. Nemesis, I tell you. Tail happy, that's on me. Too much throttle, too soon. Again, braking earlier than I'm used to for a corner like that. Takes a little bit of getting used to. And also, I can usually cheat that last corner by going in super wide, super early, and not having to touch the brakes at all. Heavy on the brakes again, through the first corner. Little wobble on the exit. Carrying good speed through there. And hard on the brakes. Almost hit the wall, but not quite. Nemesis corner once again. Hard brakes, downshift through the corner, floor it, and we're golden. Decent entry, decent exit, could be better, could be worse. Supra blowing through the straights with ease. And that's what I was talking about there, where I don't usually have to hit the brakes, or if I do, it'll just be a tap, scrub a little bit of speed. A little slower through that corner this time around. Decent lines overall. Almost hit the wall again, but just miss it. The higher rev ceiling of our new and improved Supra here is very useful. Honda shifting it there. Gotta bounce it off the limiter a couple of times. Narrow entry, wide exit, could be better, could be worse. All right, 
Let's see if I can pull it off again this time. Coasting a little bit. Uh, yeah, that's ugly. It's ugly, but it counts. All right, what do we got here for time? Yes, I finished first. No kidding. 111.309. All right, that's like nine seconds faster than just the suspension. So double or more of the horsepower is apparently good for about 10 seconds. Good to know. Well, that'll just about do it for today's video. Hopefully you learned something new. Thank you so much for watching, and if you liked what you see, give this video a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel, and share it with your friends. I'll be back soon with one more episode of How to Tune Your Car. Until then, feel free to send me suggestions on what you want to see, what you like, don't like, so on and so forth. Your feedback is key to me. In the meantime, may your lines be clean, and may your oversteer be intentional. Adios.